creation, Satan, and then uh, man and salvation. We talked about that last week. And then they will talk about the church. And then, whoops, and the next time about maintaining purity and then uh, future events. And so last week we talked about man and salvation. And so today we want to talk about the church, what uh, our um, statement of faith says. And you can look it up online. We have it posted. I, mean, I need to change it. I've found a couple of mistakes in the Japanese and the English on there. So you pull that off and redo it and put it back on. But um, So about the church. We believe the church is the body of Christ. The Bible calls it the body of Christ. Uh, we believe that the church um, was established by Jesus Christ and that it was purchased with his blood, the blood of, of Christ, and founded upon him, who alone is its head. Okay. So Christ uh, bought the church with his blood that he shed upon the cross, and then he established it, and he is the head of it. Okay. In Matthew chapter 16, we'll be looking at a few verses here. You might want to write them down. Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 16. Uh, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And to that, Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, uh, and I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The well, Catholic Church teaches that the church is built upon Peter. <laughs> That's not what Christ was saying. He was saying, that upon the statement that you just made, that um, we back to it, and says, I mean, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon that statement, I will build my church, is what he was saying. And so the church is built upon Christ. Um, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, uh, says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseer to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Okay? And that's, a, by the way, another verse for the deity of Christ, you know, because it says uh, the blood of God, you know, which is God incarnate, Jesus Christ. Um, but, Jesus purchased his church with his blood. It's his church. It's not our church. It's his church. And we are uh, under shepherds, uh, those of us who are pastors. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23 says, And has put all things under his feet, and given him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Okay? Uh, we are called the body of Christ. The church is called the body of Christ. Now, there are, when, when you look in the Bible and you see the word church, okay, there are two meanings to that word church. Um, the word is in the Greek, ek, ekklesia, which means called out. Ek is out, and kaleo is to call. So called out, we are called out uh, from among the world to be separate to God. And so we're the church. Um, but when it says church, uh, it's the, the first church is what we're talking about now, the spiritual body of Christ. Everybody who is a Christian is a member of that spiritual church, that body of Christ. And that's called the body of Christ. Okay? And so we are part of the body of Christ. And God has given each of us a function within that body. Uh, just like Paul says in another passage, he said that we're, you know, we're members of one another. And some people are feet, some people are eyes, some people are hands, whatever. Like, you know, we have, each of us have a job to do within the church. And God has given us the the um, talents of the, the, the uh, gifts to operate and to edify the church. Okay, but we are we are part of the body of Christ. We are all members of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And the body of, uh, called the body of Christ. Okay, all right. And then Colossians chapter one verse eighteen says, "And he is the head of the body, the church." So we, again, we're the body of Christ. Uh, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? that in all things he might have the preeminence. So, okay, Christ this is Christ church. We are to glorify and to magnify and to, to extol Christ. We exist to glorify God. We exist to glorify Christ. And this church's function exists to glorify Christ and to accomplish his will. We, this, is all, this church should be all about Christ, not about ourselves. It's not a social club. Um, sometimes it's you know becomes a social club, but it's not supposed to be a social club. It's a, it's a it's an organization functioning to glorify God and glorify Christ. All right. And then number two, um, concerning the body of Christ, we believe that the church was constituted and empowered on the day of Pentecost by the coming of the Holy Spirit, and that it is a spiritual organism made up of all 
who in this New Testament dispensation have been born again by the Spirit of God. Okay? So we, um, this, the church is, was born on the day of Pentecost. Now there are other, I've heard of other people who don't believe that, you know, there was another date for the start of the church, you know, maybe the resurrection of Christ or something like that, but uh, Jesus himself said that the Holy Spirit would come after he left, and so the church began with the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came on a permanent basis um, in the New Testament, in Acts, okay, and we'll look at that in a little bit, but um, Acts chapter 1 uh, verse uh, Acts 1 and 2 are where the uh, is recording the, the birth of the church there. And Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 8 says, And being assembled together with themselves, command, commanded them, and this is Christ with his disciples, by the way, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, uh, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And they therefore were come together and asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the king again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. So Jesus' uh, his disciples were talking to him, and this is in verse 9 when he was taken up and went out of their sight, and uh, then how long was Jesus with the disciples um, before Pentecost, um, after he rose from the dead? So he rose from the dead. Pentecost is 50 days from Christ's resurrection, okay? But he was with them for several days, and then he went back to heaven, and then several days later, they um, was the day of Pentecost, 50, day, 50 days. So do you, anybody know? Verse 2 says it, because I don't know, I started in verse 4, but verse 2 says he was with him 40 days, okay? So he was with him for 40 days, and then uh, he went up to heaven, and then 10 days later was Pentecost. Uh, and there's a many, many significance to that, much significance to that, but uh, we won't uh, go into that right now. But uh, so on, on the day of Pentecost, uh, the Holy Spirit came and uh, manifested himself in many signs and wonders, and the church was born in, and on that day it was added, and we'll see that in a little bit, over 3,000, you know, so. All right, and then uh, Acts chapter, we won't read the whole chapter. I have Acts chapter 2, obviously, uh, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost and things like that. Um, but that you can read that for yourself, Acts chapter 2, uh, the birth of the church was uh, in that time. And then Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseer. Be the church of God, be the purchase of own blood. We read that ago, but... Uh, so we, we are, the church was bought with the blood of Christ, and then it was established on the day of Pentecost as an organism uh, of, Christ, of uh, the body of Christ. And then, uh, I'm sorry, did I, let me see. Yes, okay, good. I thought I skipped something, but I didn't. Okay. Then uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, For by one Spirit are you all baptized into one body. We are all members of this body if you're a Christian. Whether you be Jew or Gentile, whether you be bond or free, and have been made to drink into one Spirit. So we are all members of this body of Christ. There is nobody. It doesn't matter what race you are, what uh, nationality you are, what color or not. Nothing matters whether you're male or female. It has anything to do with it. Okay? We are all members of the body of Christ if you're a Christian. Okay? So if you're a member of the body of Christ also if you're a Christian. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, 28 says, Now uh, ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set, uh, set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, uh, helps, governments, uh, diversity of the tongues, okay? On the day of Pentecost, God, uh, the, the Holy Spirit gave gifts to men and gave signs that uh, established the church, that legitimized it, that gave cr uh, credence to uh, the birth of the church. Um, on the day of Pentecost, we, we didn't read this in Acts chapter 2, but when Peter, pre Peter was preaching, uh, men heard them in their own language. Uh, many different people from different countries, and it lists the people there in, in, in Acts chapter 2. It's good to read that. Uh, many different, and they said, well, how do we hear? You know, he goes, probably somebody's like, you know, 
I didn't know Peter could preach in German. He goes, German? What are you talking about? That's French. He goes, no, it's not. It's Spanish. You know, that, that kind of thing. You know, Everybody heard him in their own language. You know, that was a miraculous uh, thing there. Uh, and uh, the Lord did that to uh, establish uh, the legitimacy. And it was his power and the Holy Spirit's power. All right. And then Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says, uh, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. So the church is permanent uh, the church will last until uh, you know Jesus will come and then the church will go to be with him and rule and reign with him okay? and then Colossians chapter uh, finally Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 says and now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is behind uh, of the affliction of the uh, affliction of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake which is the church. Okay, so we are the body of Christ. Okay, now I mentioned the church. When when you read the word church in the New Testament, there are two things that that church that that church can refer to. First of all, I can refer to the body of Christ, which is uh, all believers of all ages and all countries and all everything else. Okay. Doesn't matter if you're from Japan or America or Germany or Spain or whatever, you're a member of the body of Christ. Doesn't matter if you're born 100 years ago, thousand, you know, 1,000 years ago. If you're a New Testament saint, you are a member of the body of Christ. Okay? Uh, but the other church you see in the, in the Bible, and they're both the same word, so there's no distinction in the fact that you know one says some Greek word and one says the other Greek word. They're both the same Greek word. So, but refers to the local church. Okay? There are, there's the church universal or... The, I don't, we, I'm not, you know, we're not a Catholic church, but the church Catholic is what it's called, the universal church, okay? And um, so we, we are members of the universal church, the invisible church, if you want to say it. There's a visible, invisible, uh, the local, the universal, whatever. But there's a local church also. So God has not only established the universal church, he's also established local churches. And then in the Bible, uh, Paul wrote to many churches he wrote to the church at Rome. He wrote to the church at Corinth. He wrote to the church uh, churches at, in the region of Galatia. He wrote to the church at Ephesus. You know all the churches. And then in Revelation chapter two and three, uh, there are seven churches, local churches, to whom the uh, first two chapters are addressed. And so there is not only the, the universe church, which we are all a member of. Uh, there is also the local church, whereby we practically exercise those gifts God has given us, okay? So, uh, the Bible not only talks about universal church, talks about local church, okay? And concerning the local church, we believe that the local church is the body of, a body of born-again believers and, uh, and baptized by immersion believers, united by in organization for teaching, worship, fellowship, observing the ordinances, praying, and spread of the gospel to the ends of the world, okay? So our local church is commissioned with these things. Okay? It is made up of born-again, baptized believers, and we're united for the purpose of teaching, worship, fellowship, observing the ordinances, praying, spreading the gospel. Okay? All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Um, by the way, we, you know, you've heard what is referred to as the Great Commission, where Jesus said, you know, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That's Mark chapter 15, verse 16, verse 15, Matthew 28, 19, 20. Um, you know, make all disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then each book of the, each Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, all the gospels and Acts all have a commission, a great commission, and they are worded differently. And in Acts, this is the, what we call the Great Commission. Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you, upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. Okay? Jesus sent the church out into the world to preach the gospel. So that's one of the jobs that the church has. And the local church has a responsibility to proclaim the gospel. So not only are we to edify the saints, we are to, uh, to evangelize sinners. Okay? It's a good sermon outline, huh? Evangelize sinners and ed evangelize sinners and edify saints. <laughs> Works in English. It won't work in Japanese. <laughs> you can't alliterate much in Japanese. You especially can't alliterate something in English and then try to alliterate in Japanese. I've tried many, many times. <laughs> it's impossible. I mean, it might be possible once in a while, but uh, almost impossible. But, uh, so I usually just do it in English and forget about it in Japanese. But 
So we are to not only edify the body, we are to evangelize uh, the world. Okay? And that's uh, one of the jobs given to the local church. That's why we support missionaries. Okay? That's why my home church in America has sent me to Japan to preach the gospel here in obedience to the Great Commission. Okay? And then you'll notice here that Jesus has commanded the, the disciples to, to go from Jerusalem. He was standing uh, in, in the Mount of Olives there and speaking that and... Uh, near Jerusalem, and um, he said, here in Jerusalem, you be witnesses, and then they were in the region of Judea, Jerusalem's in the region of Judea, and then Samaria was a town farther, and then that was part of it. So out from here we go, and so that's the pattern that we should follow with our local church. We should evangelize our local area, and then we should help others to reach out farther and farther, and then we send missionaries to the most parts of the world, different parts of the world, okay? So that's all, all the job of the church, the local church. Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 41 and 42 says, And then uh, they that gladly received the word were baptized. In the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread in, and in prayers. Okay, there are many things that we can take from this passage, and we don't have a lot of time to spend on it. We're not... Uh, particularly going to exegete that passage, but there are many things that this is when the church was first established, okay? And it says, this is what it said about the, the first uh, church. It said the Jerusalem church. It says, then they would gladly receive the word. So they were saved. They received the word and trusted Christ their Savior. And then they were baptized. <coughs> I mentioned this this morning, and I kind of forgot my point this morning. wasn't mentioned in my illustration, but... Uh, I got a question here a couple weeks ago from a church, and uh, you know sometimes they, these pastors, I think they think that they don't really think that you're supported by. You know, we have over forty something churches, that, churches and individuals that support us. So if everybody sent us a questionnaire that took us hours to fill out, <laughs> we'd be do, doing nothing but filling out questionnaires. You know, but he said, "What is the meaning of baptism?" You know, so I had to go by and you know tell them what I thought uh, baptism was. But uh, so. They're, they receive the word, they're saved, and then they're baptized. So church membership requires salvation, obviously, and then it requires baptism. You need to be baptized. because, And that is the first thing in, in uh, Acts when you read that somebody was saved, they were saved and baptized. They're saved and baptized. Uh, and one of the questions on the question is how soon after they were saved should they be baptized? <laughs> like I said, I said, as soon as possible. You know, I mean, There's no date set here, but uh, the, in the New Testament, the pattern was they were saved and they were baptized, usually right then and there, you know. Uh, and so salvation, uh, baptism, is the first step in obedience to Christ's you know, command to, it says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teach all nations, and baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we teach them, and then we baptize them. We uh, evangelize them, and we baptize them. Because what is baptism? Uh, baptism is an outward, uh, and I said this in the thing too, that baptism is an outward sign of uh, the spiritual baptism it's a, it's a physical baptism water baptism is an outward sign of physical uh, spiritual baptism what is spiritual baptism you can put it into the body of Christ and I think that's why uh, the word baptism is an important and I think we immersion is the only legitimate form of baptism uh, if anybody's been sprinkled or anything like that we've had people join the church and I said you know have you been baptized yeah we've been sprinkled I said no I said have you been baptized <laughs> you've not been baptized <laughs> It's that's water to put on your head. It's not baptism. That doesn't show the picture. The picture of baptism is buried with Christ in death and raised in resurrection. You know, and so uh, that doesn't picture that. And so, uh, and then the word baptism itself, the word baptize, means to put into. Uh, and uh, there's one ver one secular use of it where somebody's talking about washing their dishes and baptizing their dishes. You know, putting it under the water. You know, in other words. So yeah, the word means to put into the water. You know, not it doesn't mean to sprinkle or put water on you. So. And then the sign is the sign of the death bearer identifying with Christ. So it's an outward testimony, a physical testimony of spiritual baptism. Spiritual baptism is when the Holy Spirit puts you into the body of Christ. And you're saved, you become a member of the body of Christ. Okay? And so they were baptized, they, they received the word, were baptized, and the same day they were added unto the church. Okay, They were added to the church. So that's how they became a member of the local church. Uh, there are 3,000 people on that day were added uh, to the church. Um, and there are many, you know, you can read, exegete this, and you can get many principles from it. Like uh, 
Somebody says, you know, why do we keep roll? Well, they didn't, I've been in the New Testament because they knew how many people were at it. You know, somebody must have counted them, okay? We keep track of them, and there's, and there's accountability. There's, the shepherd is given accountability over the, those. That, so you're responsible. We, we as shepherds are responsible to, for you, and uh, God will hold us accountable. If, if we didn't hold you accountable, if we just let you sin and didn't have anything to do, you know, didn't say anything, that's, that he will hold us accountable. And so we are accountable, hold you accountable, okay? And so there are many different things, a function that the, that the church has, okay? but it's the body of Christ, all right? And then Acts chapter 13, verse 1 through 3 says, And now there were in the churches that were in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simon, uh, that was called Niger. Uh, by the way, Simon, uh, who is called Niger, Niger is the Greek word for black. So evidently he was a black person, okay? And... Uh, so even the first church, you know, the Christians were first called Christians to the church of Antioch here. Okay? So anyway, and uh, Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, uh, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And Saul, the you know, apostle that became Paul later. Uh, as they ministered to the Lord and uh, fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein you have called them. When they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. Who was the first missionary sent out by a local church? It is Paul, sent out by the church of Antioch here. So the church was uh, had a responsibility to send people out, uh, and this is very very clear here that it, you know, they weren't they didn't say, hey, you know, I got an idea, let's call it missions and let's send by somebody. You know, what? What does it say? It says, it says now when these, these people were teaching, they were active in the ministry. Uh, verse 2 says, and, and they ministered the Lord and fasted. And the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherever I call them. So the Holy Spirit is the one that called them. The Holy Spirit calls people into different uh, jobs. And he called Paul and Barnabas here uh, to be missionaries. To be the first missionaries sent out by the church. And he mandated that. The Holy Spirit said, separate them and send them out. Okay? He said, uh, separate them for the work I call them and then when they had uh, fasted and prayed and they ate hands on them they sent them away so they sent them out they were commissioned and sent from that local church and we followed that pattern ever since we uh, send missionaries you know missionaries uh, missionaries are members of local churches somewhere and those local churches uh, commission those missionaries and send them out from that church to different parts of the world now most missionaries nowadays have a you know supporting uh, board or something like that to help them with all their practical needs, you know, their visa, or whatever, you know, if you, if you want to come to Japan as a missionary, but you don't, you're, you're saying, I don't know, I just want to come, they'll say no. <laughs> they say, what organization is sending you? And you're like, oh, I don't know, you know, I just want to come. They say, no, you have to have an organization that sends you, and so those, a mission board is, is, is a practical uh, thing. There's no mission board in the Bible. The church is the one that sends you out, and uh, any good mission board will say, we, we, we work for churches. We facilitate, the church sends them out. We just help the church to send them out. The church is the one that sends them out. And our mission board is uh, very strong on that. Um, if my home pastor ever says, uh, we don't think he qualifies as a missionary anymore, the mission board would say, you you listen to your home pastor, that's it. You know, Whatever he says goes for you. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's just a side point. But uh, this church sent them out to evangelize the world. Okay. And then uh, Mark, Mark, as I mentioned a while ago, Mark 16, 15, uh, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So Jesus commissioned his disciples, and then the church also was commissioned to send those out to fulfill the great commission. Right? Commissionary. And then, number two, we believe the local church is an independent and self governing body responsible only to Christ, who is its Savior and Lord, and that its relationship to other ecclesiastical bodies or other churches is one of fellowship only. Okay? So we are uh, independent. And the Bible gives this responsibility to the local churches, not to uh, organizations, not to hierarchical, you know, some, some people sitting in a building somewhere <laughs> telling you what to do. No, the, Jesus worked, Jesus, God commissioned Paul and Barnabas through a local church. Okay? And so we're not, we are independent independent from the Baptist church, okay? Um, because we believe in baptism like the Bible teaches. Uh, we don't, we aren't accountable to anybody. Uh, we decide what 
the Holy Spirit would have us to do among ourselves. We are self-governing. We rule ourselves. We have our own constitution. We have our own bylaws. We have our own um, uh, whatever that is in English. <laughs> our relationship with the government is our own. We don't have an organization under which we go through to the government. We are directly responsible, related to the government. Uh, so we are an uh, independent uh, church, which I believe is the Bible, with the, is the biblical way. Okay? And then in chap Acts chapter 20, verse 17, um, and from Miletus, uh, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Okay? So the church has leadership that God has designed. There are two types of leadership that the, that the, that the Bible um, mandates. Uh, number one is a pastor slash bishop slash elder. Okay? <laughs> They're all named for the same function, the same uh, office. Okay, um, they're different. They address the different functions of a pastor. A pastor, uh, the word pastor, is the Greek word for shepherd. And so, if you look at the Greek word in the New Testament for pastor, if you showed it to a Greek person who didn't, or a, whoever they read Greek and they didn't know it was from the Bible, they would say that's a shepherd, because that's what it says. It says shepherd, okay? And some passages in the Bible translated as shepherd, okay? Uh, Jesus is the shepherd of our soul, the pastor. It's the same word. Pastor and shepherd are the exact same word. Because, because the function, you know, the, the pastor is responsible to, f to feed the flock, to teach them a word, to feed them, uh, to protect them from wolves, you know, uh, my responsibility as a pastor is to uh, nourish you from the Word, to teach you this is what God's Word says, and this is how you apply it to your life, and then you can apply that to your life. Or, and my responsibility is to say, you know, this denomination or this organization or this church teaches this, and that's wrong. And the Bible says this, and they say that, and so that's wrong. Please be careful. Don't get sucked in by everybody who calls themselves a church and not a church. The people who violate the Word of God constantly and call themselves a church, you know. There are pastors that don't qualify as pastors. Uh, the Bible clearly forbids women pastors, but there are many churches who have women pastors. Now, the Bible clearly forbids many, many things that many, many churches do. And so it is my responsibility to say, this is what the Bible says. It's not my opinion. It's not what you know. I think you know this, that, or the other. It's what the Bible says, and that's what I'm to teach of, and, in, and I'm to caution against things. So that's the pastor. Okay? And it's called the pastor or the shepherd because that's what he is. That's what the, the function of that office does. And then there's the... This one here says um, elder, and then there's another one called bishop. Okay, so they, they refer, there, there are different aspects of the same office of pastor. There's only one pastor. There's not a, a bishop and an elder and a pastor. Okay, three different things. Uh, uh, there's a bishop slash elder slash pastor. And there's verses that have use all three of the same, same in the same verse, the same couple verses, uh, to refer to the same person. Okay, so they are the same thing. They're different functions. So the elder is referring to a person who has wisdom, who has age, who has wisdom, who has uh, understanding, uh, and that people can look to. Uh, the most of the word, if you look up the word elder in the New Testament, probably most of the use of the word elder in the Bible is referring to the Jewish elders, okay? Because they had elders also. They had people who were mature, who were not novices. They weren't just become, you know, just become converts or something like that. Okay, so an elder refers to somebody who is experienced, he's, um, he has maturity, has spiritual wisdom and maturity. And then, of course, bishop is, uh, is the word for uh, ruler, okay? It's translated bishop or ruler, okay? The administrator, okay? He has the responsibility to administer, to make rules and decide certain things, uh, practical things like that. So. But those are all uh, the function of the office of a pastor. So pastor, uh, elder, bishop is the same thing. All right, and then Acts chapter 20, verse 28 through 32 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Okay, that's the word overseer, is the word bishop, okay, uh, the ruler, all right, um, and to feed the, the feed the flock of God. Okay, feed the children. That word feed is the word shepherd, okay. So if you look up the Greek, it says to shepherd the, the flock of, of God, and um, and then uh, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, there shall grievous wolves enter among you and not spare the flock. Also, of your own selves shall men rise, speaking perverse things and draw men uh, draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of, everyone 
night and day with tears. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are in, which are thinking about it. So, so Paul is saying um, there, the third function of the pastor is to protect you know, the sheep from wolves. There are, there are people who will come uh, from outside and try to come into the church and uh, pretend like they're Christians, and we have them come on a regular basis, not, you know, not recently, we haven't, maybe in the last six months, but, uh, you know, people from other, you know, Toitsko by the Unification Church, and two ladies came and they want to try to make me a universal church, you know. And it's like, I uh, know, some, we get Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, we haven't had any Mormons recently, but, you know, there are all sorts of, you know, um, uh, um, apostates and, and uh, people who teach wrong, okay? So I'm to protect you against that. And the Bible, I need to study the Bible, I need to understand what the Bible says. Uh, if you don't understand the Word of God, they, those people can come and they can twist things around. And they try to. They'll twist things all over the place. <laughs> Job's Witnesses are extreme, extremely uh, very good at that. They're very good at what they do. They're very educated. They're, they're taught a lot. And so um, if you think, oh, I'm going to you know, knock down Job's Witnesses, I'll tell them the truth. You know, They'll twist you all up if you're not careful. You don't know what they teach and you don't know the truth. They'll twist it around and you'll be, you'll be saying, yeah, you'll be agreeing with them in five, five minutes if you're not careful. Okay, they, they twist all sorts of things and they have all these tactics that they use to try to twist uh, scripture around and to get, and they have a lot of uh, psychological tactics too, you know. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones that came to talk to me uh, a while back said, um, one of their tactics was, you know, oh, those Catholics, we don't believe like those, you know, me, in others, me and you, we, we, we hate those Catholics, they, they teach wrong, yeah, we believe right, they teach wrong, you know, try to, you know, get, have a common enemy. Okay, that's one of their tactics, you know, have you know, common enemy. And they'll do that on a lot of issues, you know, they'll try to get on your side and say, oh, yeah, that's what we believe, you know, and try to get you to, you know, accept them. And, um, and all sorts of things, they twist the scripture. And one of the, one of the best, best, one of the most used tactics they have, in my experience, I don't know many people may be different, but uh, they'll try to, if, you, if you're dealing with a passage, you'll say, well, look at this passage right here. It clearly teaches the deity of Christ. They'll go, oh, yeah, but look over here. And they'll try to get you right off that passage. Don't fall for that. If you ever do talk, don't fall for that. You know? They'll say, yeah, but look over here. On that, What about this over here, it says? You know, they want to get you off, you know. And if you're not wise, you go, oh, what, what does that say? Huh? What? And they'll get you right off your passage and onto something else. And then you'll forget about your, your passage that uh, taught the truth. You know? So anyway, my point is uh, there will be wolves that come in. And the pastor's responsibility is to teach. And that's why you should be in church. One of the reasons to be under a faithful pastor who believes the Bible, who teaches the Bible. Because uh, you need to understand the Bible. You need to grow. You need to understand it yourself. And you need to be protected. Sheep need protection. You know, sheep are, are helpless for the most part to defend themselves. You know, if a wolf comes in, the wolf, the sheep doesn't have defense against the wolf. He doesn't have claws or teeth or, you know, they just run and they can't run that fast. And, you know, so they're helpless, you know. And so that's why there's a shepherd to protect the sheep and to drive off the wolves or to shoot the wolves or whatever, you know. So that's what a shepherd does in the church. All right. And then... Uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, where obviously I'm going to read that, but if you read it on your own, it talks about uh, that Jesus addresses the seven churches, the local churches, were each local churches, um, and so um, there are local churches, all right? And then number three, in the local churches, we believe that uh, the ordinances of the local of the church are two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So the Bible uh, gives two ordinances, uh, that we, the church, should practice on a regular basis. Number one is baptism. Baptism, uh, baptism, it is immersion of a believer in water as a symbol of his union with, union with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and as a public testimony of faith in Christ. Okay? So it's a public testimony uh, of identifying with Christ. Go under the water to signify death, burial, and then come up, resurrection. Okay? It's a testimony. It's not something that, as the Catholic Church teaches, it's not something that adds grace to you. you know, it's not a means whereby you are saved or, or added grace to you or anything like that. Okay? Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. 
And Jesus gave us that pattern. And so when we baptize, we say, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in likeness of death, raised in likeness of resurrection. Okay. And that, that's not in the Bible. In those, it doesn't say when you baptize somebody, say this word. You know, it doesn't, but that's what the Bible says. You know, it says uh, baptizing in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. So that's why we, we say that. All right. And so baptism is a uh, ordinance that was given to the church uh, in Acts chapter two, uh, the birth of the church. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sin. And you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so uh, if you're saved, you need to be baptized. And then Acts chapter two, verse forty-one, a couple verses later, says, "And then they were they, they glad to receive His word, were baptized, and the same day they were added to the, them about three thousand souls." So uh, that's in a Baptist church. That's how we accept members uh, by baptism. Or if you've already been baptized in another church and you're just moving to the city, we can accept you by a letter of uh, recommendation by from another church, and that also is uh, identified in Scripture. We're, we're not talking about that right now, but uh, the Bible says that he brought letters from another church, you know, so letters of commendation, okay? And Paul said, I don't need letters of commendation. In other words, some people, you know, somebody comes, I'm a Christian, you know, like, well, how do you, how do we, how are we supposed to know that, you know? So they had letters from other good churches that you knew were good churches, and saying, this is a, yes, this person is a person, he's been living for Christ, and whatever, so... All right, and then uh, Romans chapter 6, verse uh, 4, talks about, uh, this is referring to spiritual baptism. Uh, if you look at the word baptism or bab baptize or anything like that in the, in the New Testament, uh, most of the time it's referring to spiritual baptism. Most, most of the time it's being, talking about being put into the body of Christ, being saved. Okay? But sometimes it's talking about water baptism, so you have to kind of distinguish them. They're both the same as far as spiritual, uh, water baptism is a symbol of spiritual baptism. Water baptism in and of itself is meaningless unless it is followed by, followed, it follows, has preceded, been preceded by spiritual baptism, okay? And this is talking about spiritual baptism, which water baptism is a symbol of. Uh, and then Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says, Therefore, uh, we are buried with him by baptism in death, that means spiritual baptism, uh, that as, like as Christ was raised from the dead, and by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Okay? So we've been put into the body of Christ by spiritual baptism. And then secondly, and uh, finally, the Lord's Supper is another ordinance uh, given to the church. Uh, it is a symbol of the believer's communion, or communion, with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and a commemoration of his death until he comes. Okay? Uh, we will invite all believers who are living in obedience to the Lord to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. Okay? Uh, we in this church practice what we call, what we don't call it, what people who usually have closed communion call us open communion. We don't say, we have open communion. No, we, we, have, we have to call it open communion because they call those closed communion. Okay? Because we open, the, you know, the communion is for the body of Christ. And if you're a member of the body of Christ, then you are, it's as long as you take it seriously and there's no sin in your life. Um, but we, you know, there are some churches, in fact, um, probably the other two churches in Nahue that I would say are good Baptist churches practice closed communion. Um, we don't, so I guess we're the only church in Nahue that fundamental good, good church, there's many, many churches, but... Uh, but anyway, so we practice open communion. Anybody who's a believer can participate in the Lord's Supper. Um, and, you know, there are cautions given, and we'll look at that in a second. But, uh, and then number two, uh, in order to honor properly the Lord's death, we will always um, precede the Lord's Supper with, a, with solemn heart-searching and self-judgment. Okay? In Matthew, uh, Jesus, when uh, before he was crucified, he gathered the disciples and he uh, initiated uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, he changed the, uh, the Passover the, uh, into the Lord's Supper, but in, in Act, Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 and 30 says, um, And uh, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and said, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood. Of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this of fruit of this vine until that day when I drink it anew 
with you in my Father's kingdom. And they had sung a, sung a hymn. They went out and did not allow that. Okay? So uh, Jesus initiated uh, the Lord's Supper. And then in Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, Paul uh, reiterated what the Lord said. In chapter 11, verse, so let's just look at 23. It's 17 through 34, but we'll just look at 23 to 26. It says, For I received of the Lord, which also I de uh, declare unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he also took the cup, and when he had supped, said, uh, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. As often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death until it comes. So the purpose of the Lord's Supper is, number one, to identify to, with the, the body and the broken body and shed blood of Christ, but also to commemorate, to remember. Uh, the Bible doesn't say how often. You know, some churches have it every week. Some churches have it every month. Some churches have it, most churches have it at least once a quarter. And we try to have it <laughs> once or twice a year if we can. Uh, but um, so the Lord's Supper is uh, a commemoration uh, and a observance, a mem memorial of Christ's death, what Christ did. Now, some people say, well, it says, um, this is my, Jesus said, this is my body, taking, this is my blood. You know? And so the Catholics believe that the blood, the, the, the grape juice or wine water becomes the blood of Christ and the bread becomes the body because it says, this is my body, you know. And uh, Lutherans believe, uh, in, you know, Catholics believe in uh, transubstantiation. And uh, the Lutherans don't go that far. They just believe in consubstantiation, they say. Uh, the elements become, uh, underneath it become the body of Christ. But it's, you know, it's the bread on top, but it's the body of Christ. And the Catholics say it changes into the body of Christ, you know. And I say, well, then you can get that, you know, just... Also, after the priest swallows it, cut his stomach open and get it. It's still going to be bread. <laughs> it ain't going to be, uh, but that's facetious, okay? The Lord didn't, the, Jesus didn't say, this is my body, meaning this is my body. He said, this is, symbolizes my body. You know, there's other passages in the Bible. Jesus said, I am the door. <laughs> you know, any man that goes in from with, uh, by me is like, does that mean he's made of wood? <laughs> no, you know, it's the symbolic. It means that you're getting to the kingdom of heaven, you have to come through him. He's the only door that, you know, and so it is a symbolic uh, meaning but um all right so that's it um so next time we'll we finish there next time we'll take up uh maintaining purity and separation all right let's go to prayer father we thank you for this time together we thank you for your word it teaches